Here's the story of a person living beside the Myra Quarry, located just outside of Fredericton, on the railroad. In 2014, the quarry was given speedy approval to do business in a protected area for environment over the third largest aquifer in Canada and to disturb the quality of life for many people living along the railroad. The whole process violated all kinds of rules and there's been no transparency and no accountability as to how that happened in the first place. Over the past six years, that quarry has been protected and no one can figure out why. But the people who live there have not been protected by the Department of Health, Department of Environment, Department of Natural Resources, or any other political means to try to get some sense of justice, some sense of accountability, some change. So here's their story, first person, like a victim impact statement. It would be really nice if you could feel what they feel and imagine what it's like to live there and to know that this could happen in your backyard just as easily. So here are some in the moments, I like to call them in the moments from 2016. 15th, 15th September 2016, a two for night, insomnia and a nightmare. In the nightmare we were moving into a hastily bought house with glaringly obvious structural issues. The front wood stoop was rotting, the eave over it leaked like a sieve, the carport was listing over. 28th September 2016, I no longer enjoy coming home. I have crossed that threshold. 30th September 2016, quote from a book I'm currently reading. It is not easy to crush a human mind, but with enough brutality, time and indifference to suffering, it can be done. 7th October 2016. What I would say were the story ever given its due. We were thrown under the bus with a clear intent to harm us. We were denied the equal protection of the laws when this happened. And when we ask hard questions about what happened here, we get nothing in return but whitewash, if that. 24th October 2016. There were six trucks transiting into Myra's pit when I took the garbage bin to the curb for pickup at 6.12 a.m. this morning. 25, 25th October 2016. <clears throat> Someone recently wrote New Brunswick Premier Brian Gallant a letter. It commenced as follows. I would like to suggest, and I know you won't go for this, but I would like to trade homes with you for a week so that you can breathe the air that we are breathing every day. Unquote. <clears throat> Right to information requests are revealing that heartfelt letters like these are being completely ignored. 26th October 2016. You have on the one hand <clears throat> a complicated story concerning people being denied the equal protection of the laws. You have on the other hand the story about a wayward cow in Lincoln. The wayward cow story is the one you investigate, the one that is aired on shift on 25th October and then again on information morning on October 26th. I don't understand. Something that I said the Ombudsman Charles Murray on the 18th of March 2016. Over the course of two meetings, encompassing four plus hours, Blaine Higgs listened to how the Myra Quarry came to be sited within a long-standing residential agricultural area, directly upwind from long-standing residents of Estes Bridge. He wondered in confidence why you weren't taking more of a public stand against what has been happening here. I duly pass the baton on to you regarding his query, not knowing the answer to his question. I am a Myra Quarry victim. The, um, and that was four years ago now. That was four years ago. Yep. And things have actually gotten worse out there, but you have moved away. We left not on our terms at a time not of our choosing, yes, yeah. but I guess the, I'll answer the question you just posed with questions. I mean, I think the best way to sum this up is, well, to what extent did the lives of Myra's victims improve under Brian Gallant's watch? And to what extent did the lives of Myra's victims improve under Blaine Higgs' watch? Nope, the people, the victims of Myra are still being thrown under the bus 
It doesn't matter if it's the liberals, it doesn't matter if it's the conservatives, it doesn't matter if it's the People's Alliance. Nothing has changed. In all these years and all this research and all this anguish, what's, what's the biggest question that still remains unanswered? Oh, there are a lot of them. And I guess <clears throat> for the purpose of this hour and change, where would you like to go? Would you like to talk about the process? Well, would well, you like to talk about what it's like to be home wrecked? Would you like to talk about compensation? Would you like to talk about the kind of conversations that are not taking place, that should have taken place six years ago? Um, there's a lot that we could focus on. I have a friend who used to work commercial crime, and when he came in to visit yeah, last week, and I said, so how, how can we find out if something was corrupt? Like, what do you need in order to publicly say this is corrupt? And he goes, you have to find the signature on the letter or on the piece of paper that did that made the decision or made the thing go. So you have to have a, a serious paper trail. So I started to giggle because you guys, <laughs> I don't know how many banker boxes filled with stuff. We have hundreds of pages, um, Dennis. The problem really is to boil it down for an audience like yeah. we'll be watching this because I think that what you have to sort of do is sort of give them a way in. And you have to paint pictures for people. You have to show them that this could happen to them. I mean, you can tell a story about bullies who act, or people who act like bullies when the fight is fixed in their favor, but act like cowards when the fight is not. And I think we have elements of that in this particular story, and maybe that's another show. Um, so I'd like to do for these three monkeys here, see no evil, speak no evil, and hear no evil because they might factor into this. Good, and hold them up right by... Uh, oh, sure, well... Just above your glass, yeah, right there, yeah, well, high enough. I mean, the question here is who would you rather have as your checker and balancer, I guess, in government? I don't know. But anyway, this is a New Brunswick story. Listen up. Gather around, children. <clears throat> You're a participant in a closed-door meeting where dozens of tough questions are being tabled. Your role is to see what happens. That is, does the minister or bureaucrat they're directed toward answer the questions? Are they even minuted? Does the minister or bureaucrat they're directed towards promise to get answers to these questions? Does she or he get answers to these questions? Does she or he apologize for not getting any answers to these questions? Does she or he do any of the above at all? You see none of the above happening. You grasp that the only way to halt behavior along these lines is to expose it. Your role, again, is to monitor what happens should any such attempt be made. In other words, who in these circumstances will be the one quietly running all the interference? who in these circumstances will be the one trying to gaslight on behalf of those who appear to have the most to lose should any such attempt be made? Who is running interference and gaslighting in this regard gradually becomes crystal clear. You're now tasked to monitor what happens if new tough questions should suddenly and formally start surfacing along the lines of, say, if an unclothed emperor's version of what we should shut up about and leave alone is allowed to become what we should shut up about and leave alone in such regards. What have we lost in the bargain? If Stonewalling's version of what should pass for permissible discussion in such regards passes for permissible discussion, what have we swallowed, hook, line, and sinker? Minister Jeff Carr, do you, send, do you see any of Myra's victims as fellow human beings entitled to respect, kindness, and justice? If yes, then where are the answers to all those tough questions they've been tabling dating back to April 2014? Picture this now. You're a participant in a closed door meeting trying to justify six years worth of this type of governance and civil service. Reasonable questions like these, stonewalled. Forthright correspondence, like the following, never accorded the courtesy of a response. 
Picture now someone trying to make the case for why questions and correspondence along such lines shouldn't be addressed in any way that preferences those who ask them. Picture someone else trickily tasked with illumining how bad decisions can be derived from good decision-making processes without in any way making the good decision-making processes responsible for such bad decisions and fumbling the attempt. Picture yourself sitting there, mulling all the implications of what you're witnessing. That is, if a cover-upper's version of what should pass for checks and balances in such regards passes for checks and balances, what then? If a homewrecker's version of what should pass for a meaningful remedy in such regards passes for a meaningful remedy, what then? If gaslighting's versions of what should pass for the facts of the matter in such regards pass for the facts of the matter, what then? Let me now briefly paint you a third picture. You. You. Some of the meetings in which people are plotting last lines of defense for audacious behavior along every one of the previous pictured lines are doing what they can to look the other way. You, hearing who in these meetings is buck-passingly saying in effect, holy jumpins, why pin your hopes on me? You, seeing who's trying to discredit anything that would be meaning, a meaningful remedy for, in such respects, you, seeing who's mulling the Lord Jim fix some into it they're in and wanting to nonetheless do something they sense deep down they shouldn't. You, not feeling comfortable going into such rooms and subsequently being told to be generous about what has gone on in them. You, Maybe wondering, finally, what the point is of worlds where no expense is spared to enable all this sort of taxpayer underwritten behavior, where finding something else to talk about has increasingly become the default toxic masculinity prone staple of empty vessel dead hand ways of officiating in such contexts. Something to pivot off of. That reminds me of Kafka. <laughs> well, six years of this, I mean, where do you want to begin? I think we talked about that in our previous interview. Um, there's a lot here. Do you, did you want to name any names from all those meetings? Well, we do you can remember the cast of characters that you've had well, to deal with. Yes, I very viscerally do, <laughs> and I could talk a lot about various of these characters. But I think before we talk about, Maybe we should just limit it to people like Brian Gallant, Blaine Higgs, and, and Jeff Carr, who's the current minister. And maybe to a lesser extent, we can talk about Kelly Simmons and Perry Haynes, who were the uh, deputy minister and the assistant deputy minister. I know Kelly Simmons has uh, moved on to reign over workers' comp here, which raises all sorts of questions in my mind. But before we go there, do you want to talk about accountability and compensation sure. because sometimes people ask me I mean wh what do you how do you value what you just said in, in how do you value a home wreck person's life I mean I, I heard the other day that when you're a prisoner in one of the like up in Renus or someplace like that that it costs the government roughly 140,000 per prisoner uh, to maintain those people in food and shelter, you know, the crowbar hotel kind of life. Well, what about these people who are victims of home wrecking up the Royal Road there? What are they getting for being home wrecked? It's interesting in doing the, the homework and listening to the different stories <clears throat> and then asking outside the box from that about typical uh, business protocols or typical government protocols so when industry moves into a, a rural agricultural somewhat residential area um, there's usually a moment in time when the residents are offered like a one-time offer will give you a full market value for the house and to give you a chance to leave and then after that no complaining and there was never there's never been that moment even after the fact, there's never been that moment. The government's never 
come through with saying, okay, we can't fix what's already broken, but we can give you a way out, that kind of thing. So Well, the horrible there's, there's thing is, nothing. the horrible thing is, is in when you get, get into meetings that are in camera, they, they are ready to admit that they botched the whole thing because it was really an Estes Bridge impact, but it was t tailored as a Douglas local service district yeah. initiative. Estes Bridge people are the ones that are getting whacked there, and the ministerial regulations for Estes Bridge say none of this is allowed. None of what's going on. You live in a residential agricultural zone, and not only that, water is a very important part of where you live, so we're going to protect your well water. Yeah. It, is, it is the protocol of government to offer 150% or 300% in some cases for people who are about to be whacked like this. Prince of Wales, New Brunswick was a recent example of some gas line going in and look, you know, if you want to stay here, you can stay here. But if you want to leave, given what you know is going to be attached to the kerfuffle going on with this industrial kind of stuff, you can take 150% and you can go from here. I think that would have been a, I think that would have been a decent thing to do. Unfortunately, there are people who would probably say, well, my assessment is such that I don't think I could find the equivalent of what I've built with hard sweat equity here. And I've talked and had very compelling conversations with that t sort of a person who's been living there for 20 or 30 years, and I don't know what to tell people who are caught in the crosshairs when it comes to that. But what price do you, the audience, what price do you, Dennis, put on waking up to the sounds of stone crusher noise? The smell and taste of wind-blown dust, heightening levels of manganese in your drinking water, which incidentally it, that causes dementia and Parkinson's disease, blasts that shake your home's foundation, sleepless nights and lack of appetite owing to a cratering quality of life, dying trees, meetings with bureaucrats who don't have what it takes to even answer the simpler questions you table in such regards. What price? What cost, on the other hand, ought fairly be attached to the home records of people like this, given a host of provincial and federal government statutes, architectures, and guarantees to the effect of, quote, the New Brunswick Ombudsman Office has one central mission, to ensure that all New Brunswick citizens are treated with administrative fairness by government and its agencies. What cost? No, because it's too far above the salary grade of certain civil servants and elected officials to see or think or feel these things. Permit me to read two excerpts from a former neighbor of mine, social media post following a recent big blast of the Myra Quarry which showered her home with dust earlier this month. I can't open my windows and enjoy spring. The noise, the trucks, the dust, it's non-stop. Every 40 seconds a truck goes by. Same for all of us on the flats. All effing day and evening. I was born and raised on the flats. Made my home here. As an adult, now it's nothing. It's hell. Question for those officiating over this sort of outcome. All of you. Past and present. You don't see any problem with this picture? None at all. Make question avoidance and beating around the bush in such regards somehow look excusable? You don't see any problem with that either? Maintain and place those wittingly or unwittingly overseeing such behaviors? You can't see any problem with that sort of picture either. Blaine Higgs, who looked us in the eye and said, why don't you get Charles Murray onto this when he's not in power? Well, he comes, he's now in power. So here he says on November, what is it? The 9th, 2018. Let me say it clearly, he says to everybody. I mean every word that we say, we will hold ourselves to a higher standard. When we are asked a sincere question, we will give a straight answer. When we are given a job to do, we will measure the results and share them without spin. When we make mistakes, we'll humbly own them and work to do better. Great. Where's the follow through? Uh, I mean, the, these questions that I showed you earlier, I'm not going to 
tediously walk through them all, but these were questions that were tabled at a meeting at which Blaine Higgs was present, at which Jeff Carr was present, at which Wes McLean, who's Blaine Higgs' assistant, was present, at which Kelly Simmons was present. And this meeting happened in May of 2019. None of the questions that were tabled at that particular meeting a year and change ago have ever been addressed, even though they were formally tabled. I mean, some of them were quite simple, and I'll read the simplest ones. They never elicited a straight answer from anybody at the Premier's office or the Department of Environment in the interim since. Question. Why was Myra's dirty, noisy, dust-spewing quarry sited in a narrow valley prone to thermal inversions directly above long-standing, well-dependent residences and prime critical species habitat? We could talk about the prime critical species habitat later. What sort of epidemiology condones the siting of industrial quarries directly upwind from long-standing residential areas? Never got a reply from Ministry of Health, Department of Environment. This question is one that has come up over and over again. No answers. Thank you, Jennifer Russell. No answers. Thank you, Blaine Higgs. No answers. Thank you all, on, all down the list here. Here's another question that was asked at that May 2019 meeting. Why hasn't Myra's operation actually been halted given that it's within a zone of indisputably critical habitat for a federally recognized pollution intolerant species at risk? Those are the simple questions. Some of the questions that have been asked are literally 150, page, uh, 150 words long. I mean, this is what the ministerial regulations and rules say for Estes Bridge. Dada, 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 dada. Why weren't these ministerial regulations and rules honored in 2014? People bought into this place in good faith because that's what they're understanding us of where they lived, only to find out that those rules and regulations aren't worth, as I said in a previous interview, the, uh, the paper they're written on. Mm -hmm. everybody, of, everybody out there, again, who lives in rural areas, be afraid, be very afraid, because you might have spent years writing those rules and regulations for your local service district. They're not worth the paper they're written on. There's, there'll be some people who will watch this and go, well, you know, I'm sorry, but things change and a rural area becomes more of an industrial area, so you guys just kind of have to deal with it. Cool. Um, so from the from the business point of view, because that's what they tend to use to justify the whole thing, right? Oh, it created jobs, so it got us cheap rock. But. Well, if you'd been at the uh, April 2014 public hearing, questions were raised about bringing something and the jobs that were attached to them that could, you know, why the rock here? The rock could be anywhere. Like, why don't put it out there on that Marysville, that new Marysville bypass in the middle of nowhere where nobody is going to be impacted, somewhere just north of Marysville there. That would be a good place. People had a lot of suggestions, like, why is, you know, what's the backstory with this particular character? He comes to our particular public hearing and he doesn't have any business plan to show us. He just points a finger at a map and he says he's a good guy and he's, he's going to uh, run a gravel pit. And he's going to, you know, it's, he's an environmentalist, some, some people heard him say. And, um, but this doesn't wash well with people. They want more information at this public hearing because one person in particular wants to know about his past. They seem to know more about his past than the rest of us do. In the correspondence, Jeff Carr, you received on 3rd March 2019, reference was made to a quarry on the Lower Stone Ridge Road in Burt's Corner that was shut down. Well, why was it? Who were the culpable parties there? And why are the government's records in, the, in this respect withheld when they are requested? In your correspondence of 20th March 2019, this matter was passed over in silence. Please address these three questions as well. So this guy is shut down in Burt's Corner. And it's the same owner? The Myra. same owner, and he's put over above, right above another residential place. So this would be Mr. Pembridge, right? Yeah, and um, the story that we've heard is that a house was blasted off its foundation over there. 
That's the story that I've heard. I've, I heard it from an executive assistant of a, of a member of the Legislative Assembly. I tried to write to information all of this stuff. I asked questions of the bureaucrats of the Department of Environment. It's a touchy, sensitive subject. But somebody at that April 2014 meeting did know about that. And they pointed a finger, and you can read the, uh, the proceedings of that April 2014 public hearing meeting. And that person pointed a finger at this guy, and he said, you've broken the law, haven't you? And here we're all sitting there, and we're thinking our own questions, like where's the environmental impact assessment here? Where's the, you know, where's the health costing here? What, what's, what, 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 this guy says it's a gravel pit, and then he says it's going to be a rock quarry. I mean, all this, all this nonsense, all this kind of like, sort of like, we're not going to be honest with you guys at all. So as far as the business case for this place being where it is, there is no business case for it where, where it is. It's saving maybe the city of, of Fredericton a little bit of cost and expense, but these truck drivers, they could be anywhere, wherever the quarry is. They could move it out to the back of beyond where it should be. They could have a protocol that these things shouldn't be anywhere near people's long-standing residential areas. This thing was plopped right into a long-standing residential area that was zoned as a long-standing residential area, and then they changed it for this guy. Not for a gravel pit. He got an environmental impact waiver for a gravel pit, not for a industrial rock quarry. He got his environmental waiver for being in Douglas. He is in Estes Bridge, where his haul-out road is basically ruining the lives of people with all the trucks going by on a daily basis, 500 trucks a day. The Myra Quarry permit was renewed last November. The Deputy Minister of Environment, Perry Haynes, was directly called out for not addressing long-standing questions dating back to 2014, immediately prior to the decision being made. Perry Haynes has not answered any of these questions in the interim since. Neither has Jeff Carr. I guess I could say one other thing. Three cheers to those of you watching who have taken on what I'm describing in your own ways. Functioning democracy really suffers absent people like you. So keep on fighting the good fight. Keep it up, knowing you're not alone. Stay safe. Good. Stay out of harm's way. Good. Thank you.